Right, so welcome to part four, visualizations. Um, so today we'll give you an introduction to ggplot2. So ggplot2 is a package um, and it's included in the Tidyverse collection of packages, which lets you make these really great, really nice looking and informative um, visualizations, data visualizations. So um, before we get started with this, so this is going to be an introduction. We don't assume that you're familiar with ggplot at all. You don't need to know anything about ggplot. We'll start from, from scratch. Um, and these materials, by the way, you should have them. Um, they are in the WeTransfer link. So maybe Kyla can put that or has put that in the chat. Um, right, so we'll do an introduction today. Um, and what we want to say up front is that ggplot is really a huge topic. We could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. There are so many options. There are so many other add-on packages. This is really endlessly customizable. Um, and we will probably do some kind of a series on ggplot features. So today we'll stick to the basics, but uh, we'll probably do something on other features of ggplot. All right, so to get started, as always, the first thing we, we tend to do in a script is to load the tidyverse. Um, and then we will read in two data sets. So the first one is the penguins data. So this is tidy Tuesday data on these three penguin species. And then for the exercises, we uh, yeah, we'll also go back to a data set we've used before. So this is this movies data set that has some data on films um, and the Bechdel test, um, these Bechdel test ratings, which checks if there are named women, two named women in a film, if they talk to each other and if they talk about something other than a man, that, that would be the Bechdel test. Um, and we'll also read that in. We have a tiny little filter condition here um, just to narrow down the data um, set a little bit. So this just uh, filters down the rating um, to these four categories. So this is for children um, and then it goes up to um, rated adult, I think is what that means. I think these are American uh, <laughs> ratings, uh, rating systems. I'm not uh, super familiar with that, but we just filtered it down. So it's a little bit neater for visualization later. Okay, so make sure you have these. You can see in my environment up here, I have these, um, yeah, the, those two data sets popped up and they're called movies and penguins. All right, and we got some information while reading that in. And the first thing we'll actually, do is convert uh, some of these variables to factors. And this is important for ggplot if you try to visualize something that should be a factor. Um, so it should be a category is a categorical variable, but R doesn't know that um, the visualization might, might be messed up a little bit. So we'll make sure to do that. We can have a look here at the, at the structure of the penguins data set with this uh, command. And we can see species, so the penguin species, island, um, also sex. These are all characters or character variables or so text variables right now. So what we'll do is we'll use a mutate to uh, convert them to factors. Okay, so just do that. And then if we run this again, we can see we now have factors. So factor with three levels. So we have three different species. Island is also a factor with also three levels of so three different islands and so on. Okay. So let's get into ggplot. And you'll you'll when you read about or hear about ggplot, you'll you'll encounter this idea of the layered grammar of graphics. So what that means is that when you build up a plot, you have several distinct layers that you put on top of each other. So we'll talk uh, through the, the three layers that you always need to get a plot. And the first one is just the data. So you start with ggplot and then you put data equals penguins. So just to specify the data frame that we'll use, that's the first layer, the first step. And if we run that, we see nothing. <laughs> so we just see this rectangle. Um, and that's all that happens at this stage. So this first layer, nothing much happens. We just tell ggplot that um, the penguins data, that's going to be the relevant data frame. We'll want to visualize something from that data frame. Okay, and then we move on to the second layer. So first layer is the data frame. And then second layer is going to be the aesthetic mapping. 
So that's going to be which variables will be shown. So because we have lots of, we have how many variables? Uh, we have eight variables in that data frame, which ones are actually going to be shown in our plot. Um, and also where, so which variable is going to be on the X axis and which one is going to be on the Y axis, right? So that's stuff that goes into this aesthetic mapping layer, right? And the way to do that is to start with AES, so for aesthetic, aesthetic layer. And then, okay, so on the X axis, what do we want on the X axis and what do we want on the Y axis? So that's just X equals and then a variable and then Y equals and then a variable. So here we're going to pick out um, the bill length and, and the bill depth, right? So the second layer, that's going to be the variables that we want to visualize and on which axis um, they should be, so X or Y axis. And there are some more options that we'll get to later in this aesthetics um, layer. So that's the second layer and you'll see that we have to use a plus here. So we started with, we started with ggplot and the data and then we need a plus and then we drop down a line. So we just hit enter to drop down a line um, and then we specify the second layer. So let's run that. And something has happened, which is good. So you can see that R or ggplot now has put the variable names on the relevant axes. So we said X axis should be bill length. So you can see that that appeared here and Y axis that also, it just put the variable name on it. And you can also see that it already started labeling. So it already looked at what's the range for these variables um, and started setting up um, the scale of these axes, right? Okay, so that's the second layer, the variables and where they should be. And then the third layer is the geome. So this is about what kind of plot are we making? So what kind of, what kind of a shape should ggplot use to actually show the data? Um, and we'll go through a couple of, oh, okay, yeah, kind of, kind of a lot of examples um, later on. For now, we'll just do a scatter plot. So we'll want points. We want each data point to be re represented by just a point. So again, we have to use plus and we drop, da uh, drop down a line and we write geome point. Don't forget these brackets. <laughs> That's a common error I keep uh, making. Um, and we have our first plot. All right, so now we have actually, um, yeah, now we can actually see the data, right? So each of these data points represents one penguin in the data set, so one data point in this data set. Um, and it shows the bill length by the bill depth. Okay, and I can actually, maybe we'll have a quick look at what happens because it's actually a helpful error message, I think. If you forget these brackets, <laughs> the error message actually says, did you forget to add parentheses, right? So this is a very nice, helpful message. Make sure that you have these parentheses to get a plot. And you can see there's a little bit of a message here that two rows had missing values for some of these variables, either of these variables. So ggplot automatically removes these before plotting and just gives you um, yeah, informs you about this. So this is nothing to worry about. It just means you have two missing values. Okay, so this is the template. So we have the first layer is the data, which data should ggplot use. Second layer is the aesthetics. So this will be um, which variables on which axes, and then later on we'll get to colors. Um, and then the third layer is the geome. So what shape, what type of plot? And we'll go through a couple of these. So here we have um, a little template, right? Just to show it again. So it's always ggplot and then data, the data frame, plus the aesthetics, second layer. So x equals some variable, y equals some variable. And then geome something. And we'll see a few examples of geomes. Right, so next we'll talk through a couple of um, common combinations of variables you might want to visualize and how you could visualize them. So visualization options for, for these pretty common, um, yeah, combinations of variables um, because that, that can be pretty tricky. So even if you 
know how to use ggplot, if you've understood the basic template and so on, if you actually want to apply it to data, it can be kind of tricky figuring out, especially which geome you need. So we'll talk about a couple of different um, geomes here. And before we do that, we just want to make clear this distinction between discrete variables and continuous variables. So discrete variables, um, these can only take, take on certain values. So these are um, categories um, in R, they would be factors, right? So something like the participant ID of a person or their native language, or in our data set for the penguin, penguins, we have uh, species, island, and sex. So the factors, right? Those would be discrete. And then the, um, the other option that we'll talk about here is continuous. So these would you be your um, numeric variables and they can take on any value, right? So they're not limited to specific values or specific labels. Um, they can take on any value. So these would be the numeric variables. So um, bill length and depth and, and so on. Also flipper length and so on. So the numeric variables. And now next we'll go through um, a couple of scenarios. So what if you have one discrete variable? What if you have one continuous variable? And we'll go through a couple of options. Obviously, this is not exhaustive. <laughs> there are more um, options you might have, but just to give you an idea. And these are, I think these are commonly used ones. Okay, so we'll start with one discrete variable. So one category. Um, and what we often want to do for that is to look into how many data points do we have for each each category, right? So for example, species. So we have three different penguin species. We know that much, but how many penguins per species do we have in the data set? Um, and here, because we only have one variable, the aesthetics layer only also has one variable. So here we only have X equals species. And then the geome is going to be a bar graph, right? So that's geome bar. And if we run that, we get this plot, make it a bit bigger here, that shows us that we have 150 of the Adelie species. And then um, let's see, a little bit above, yeah, maybe like 60, 65 chin strap and 125 and two penguins. Not sure if I'm pronouncing any of these right, um, but you get the idea, right? So um, this counts how many penguins per species we have in this data set. And the nice thing here, so if we look at the penguins data set, if we just open that, you can see that one line is one penguin. So this is tidy, right? One line is one row is one observation is one penguin in this case. But you can see that ggplot already did all this counting for us, right? So it counted up how many of each of these penguins do we have in this data set. So you don't need to do anything else, right? If your data is tidy, you just write g on bar and r will count how many penguins per species. And obviously we can do the same for island. So if we just change the um, aesthetic to x equals island, we can do the same here, right? So how many penguins were uh, recorded on each of these three islands? Okay, so that's one discrete variable. So one category, you often want to count how many data points do you have for each um, level of the factor for each category. Um, what to do if you have one continuous variable, so one numeric variable. Um, and same thing here, we only have one variable. So our aesthetics only has one variable and that's fine. And then we have a couple of options. Um, so the first we'll do is a histogram. So geom histogram. And the variable is bill depth. So just one numeric variable. And again, you have a count, right? So you have how often does each of these values appear in the data? And you can see that R put this range of variables into bins. So these are called bins. Um, so it summarizes them a little bit. It puts them into kind of ranges and it tells you that it's using 30 different bins. So it's splitting up this range of values into 30 bins. Um, and it you can actually change that. And that's 
um, yeah, that can be a little bit tricky figuring out what the right bin width um, is. So you can play around with this a little bit. You can you can try it out if you have a really small bin width. Let's see if I can uh, do this. Oops, that was not correct. Yeah, no. Is it bins maybe? Let's see. It was not bins. Oh no, it was bins. Okay, good. So we can change how many bins we have by writing something in these brackets for geom histogram. So bins equals 100. So that will be a lot of bins. We're splitting up the data into quite a lot of different um, kind of subcategories. And you can see that this looks really busy. It, it makes it look as if there are several groups somehow. So this is clearly too small. Let's go down by a bit. Okay, now we have 50 bins, so just half of these. Still maybe a little bit big. So this is a bit of a trial and error. Um, yeah, process of trial and error. So this might still be a bit high. Let's go the opposite way. Let's just put it into five bins. Okay, so now you can see if you have too few bins, it's really misleading. You don't really get to know anything about the distribution of this variable, right? Um, so I think I liked 35 maybe something like that, right? Um, so this is something to be careful with. And that's also a reason why some people don't um, like histograms as much. Um, so we'll show you an alternative in, um, in a second, yeah? But just again, so this is just looking at the build depth and um, visualizing how many values or how many penguins have which build depth. And you can see that this is, um, so in the middle we have the most values, right? And then towards the end, so very short or very long um, bills uh, occur pretty rarely. And the most values are here kind of in the middle. Okay. Oh yeah, here we had the code about bins. So I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> so I didn't need to figure it out by myself, but I didn't check. Okay, so let's look at an alternative just to compare and see um, what else we could use here. So again, we're still with one continuous variable, what to do with one numeric variable. Um, and an alternative would be a density plot, right? So still the same, same variable, build depth. But here you can see instead of these separate bars, we have this smooth line going over it, trying to show you the, the distribution. So this is fitting a smooth line in instead of um, instead of several bars. Um, and there's quite um, a lot of debate <laughs> about what to do. So when do you use when do you use a histogram and when do you use a density plot? And the recommendation that you can that you often find is that with large data sets you should use density plots. So these um, and with smaller data sets, you should use histograms. But I've yet to find a concrete recommendation what, what a large data set means, right? So in doubt, you could maybe try both and see because they, they do give you slightly different information. So maybe you could try both. Um, uh, we'll next talk about what to do if you have two continuous variables or so two numeric variables. Uh, so we've already seen this. So the very first graph um, that we did was bill length by depth, right? So one option would be this um, scatter plot with geom point, where each data point is, is just represented by a point. Um, and then we also tried this geom smooth, where it adds this, um, sm or not adds, where it replaces that with a smoothed line. Right, to try and show the relationship between bill length and depth. And then the nice thing here is that you can just add, so we've talked about the layered grammar of graphics, so we can just add several layers, several geomes on top of this. So here we have geom point, and then we continue with another plus, geom smooth. So we can put, we can make a scatter plot and then put this smoothed line on top. Okay, so we can add several geomes 
to a graph, as many as we like, really. We could add more if it made sense <laughs> for the data. So here we have um, a scatter plot, so geom point, and then plus geom smooth to add this line. Okay, so that's those are options. That's what you can do if you have um, two continuous or two numeric um, variables. Then the last um, variable combination we'll talk about um, today before we make our graphs colorful and, and looking prettier uh, is one discrete and one continuous variable. So one category and one numeric variable. So let's say we want to look at build depth again and we want to do that separately for the different species, right? And the information that we get, um, well, no, let me take a step back, actually. If you have, you're probably familiar with this summary um, call. So if you call that on a variable, you get some information on how this is distributed. So you get uh, things like the mean and the median and so on, minimum and maximum values. Um, and there's a visualization option which also shows you this information, not the mean, I don't think, but everything else also shows you that. Um, and that would be a box plot. So let's make a let's make box plots um, for the different penguin species and show their bill depth. Okay, so that's what that looks like. So here we have uh, the three different species on the x-axis, and they each get a separate box plot. So what do these box plots mean? <laughs> so this line in the middle is the median, right? So this line, the median is almost the same for these two species. And what it shows is um, where does, so this is the middle midpoint of the data. So 50% of the data is below that value and the other half is above that value. So the median is the midpoint. Um, so that's this thick line in the middle. Then these lines here and here, so that form this box. Um, these are the first quartile and the third quartile. So these are, um, so this lower line here, 25% uh, of the data is below that value and 75 is above. All right, so that's this line. I really hope you can see my cursor a little bit. So the lower line of the box is what I'm talking about. And then the upper line is the opposite. So 75% of the data are below. 25 are above, right? And then you have these whiskers. So these lines, are, these are called whiskers and um, that extend. Um, and these dots would be called outliers. So these dots are beyond, I think this is um, the interquartile range. So this, uh, the difference between this line and this line. <laughs> I really wish you could see my, my cursor a little bit better or maybe I could make it yellow or something. Um, this is 1.5, the interquartile range. So that's where 50% of the data is, um, and then plus that value. So if these points, if there are points outside of that, those would be these little dots. So these, these are outliers basically, right? So this gives you a little bit of information of how this data is distributed. So how the build depth is distributed for these three species. So you could see here that the um, Adelie and uh, Chinstrap um, penguins have a really similar median. Um, the interquartile range, so this box is similar-ish, a little bit larger, so a little bit more kind of variation for the chinstrap penguins here. And you can see that the Gentoo penguins have a much lower median bill depth. Right? So that would be the, yeah, the interpretation of this plot. Um, so that's one option if you have one category and one numeric variable. Another um, very popular option is called a violin plot. So we'll just change geom to geom violin and we'll just look at what that looks like. Okay, so the way to read these is imagine you had a density plot, so one density plot for each of these um, species. And then imagine that it's just mirrored um, by 90 degrees, right? So instead of having a line that goes like this, you have a line that goes like this, right? So this is the axis and it just goes like that. 
right? So it's just mirrored. And then it's also, oh, sorry, it's flipped by 90 degrees and then it's also mirrored. And that's why it's called violin plot because sometimes they look like violins. <laughs> Not so much right now, I feel, but sometimes they do. So this is an option that gives you um, a density plot um, for these three different categories. So that that's really useful. Um, and we can also, again, add another layer so we can layer a box plot on top of that. So here we have an example with a violin plot and then also a box plot on top, right? So that's nice because you can see both the distribution. So where do you have lots of values? Where do you have fewer values? And you can also still see the median and the quartiles and the information that the box plot gives you. Right, so you can kind of overlay this. Okay, and one thing you can also do here is, so this was a little bit hard to read. I'll take it out again to show you what it looked like. So if you don't add any options in here, the box plot is, is kind of um, making it harder to read some of the, of the lines here is kind of um, on top of that. So what we can do in GeoBox plot is change the width. And I've just taken 0 0.3, maybe that was a bit small, 2.4. And you can see that they've been narrowed a little bit. And now they don't cover up any of these lines anymore. Okay, I will hand over uh, to Kyla. Great. Okay, so now we've talked a lot about like the basic building blocks of ggplot, the different layers of the graphics from data to the aesthetics to the geomes. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions already about how do you add color, right? So in ggplot, you have fundamentally two options for adding color. You have both fill equals, so the argument fill and the argument um, color. And the difference here is just that, or the rule of thumb is that fill is used for like larger spaces that you need to fill in, whereas color is used for small sections. So you'll use color for like dots and lines. Uh, you'll use fill for like big blocks, for example. So let's start with color. Um, you can spell it this way. I, that's not how I spell color. I spell it this way. It doesn't matter. They both work fine. Sorry to interrupt, Kyla. Can you zoom in a little bit? Oh, yes. Is that big enough? Uh, maybe one more. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, let's start off with color. Um, and then one thing, the, the most basic thing you can do is just change the actual color. So like in our scatter plot above, we can add color equals blue. And you can see we're adding it down here in the geome call for this geome. Um, and that's exactly what you saw Yulia do with like the bins argument on histogram or with the width argument on the box plots. And you can just do color equals blue. And you can see here that this is in quotes and this is in quotes because it's not a variable like this is um, a variable that's found in a data frame, but this is just a string that we're feeding it to tell the color. So it's important that this has quotes, otherwise uh, you will get an error here. Because it's actually going to look for like, some sort of column or something in your environment that's called blue, if it doesn't know that you're trying to feed it like a string. So yeah, you can also do different colors like pink um, or orange. And you can also do custom colors, which is something that we hope to cover in the future meetup, but we don't have time for it today. But just that you know that there's a lot of like basic colors that you can use to change, um, yeah, the color of all the points. But we can also do something a little bit more informative with color, and that is that we can use it to map a third variable into the the graphs. So you've seen. Up until now, we've had either one or two variables represented in our charts, but we can actually introduce a third variable by mapping it to one of these arguments. So for example, with color, um, we had before this, th this is this graph with the dots for um, the depth of the bill and the length of the bill of the different types of penguins. But we don't know like, what the different species are here. You can see that maybe there's kind of some clustering going on, but we don't know that, that information is not available to us here. 
But if we use color equals species, then we can bring that information into the um, into the into the graph. So you can see, well, first of all, let's see how that looks. So you can see when we bring in species that we have like this chin strap or the um, Adelie or the Gentoo penguins, they're pretty clearly clustered. So this, this graph is definitely more informative than the one that averages over all the different types of species. But you can see there's a big difference here in the syntax. So here we have color equals yellow in parentheses, uh, sorry, in quotes down here in the geome. And here we have it within the AES. So within the aesthetic label or um, the layer. And the reason for that is that uh, species here is one of our variables in our data frame. So it's available here in our environment. So we don't need quotes and we put it in the AES to let uh, ggplot know that we're trying to map something from the data frame into our chart here for color. So in, a common mistake and one that I make all the time is to try and put color, <laughs> like color equals blue up here in the aesthetic mappings. And if you do something like this, it's actually going to like go look for something called blue over here in your in your environment. It doesn't find anything, so it just assume, assumes everything must be blue, and then it gives it its default color, which is like red. So then you have this really funny plot where you have like um, it's saying that this is blue when it's really red, um, and that's happening just because you have put something that isn't actually an aesthetic mapping in the aesthetics, and you really meant to put it just down here plain old in the geo. Uh, you can also use this for smooth. Someone asked before how you make colored lines. And so you can use this for different geomes um, like smooth. You can see here with this type of data that then ends up making three lines because you've, you've mapped color to another variable. So it's bringing like a third variable in to the picture. And if you have something that's like um, in aesthetic mapping, like if you're using species here still, then any geome that comes below it is going to inherit these properties. So just like how geom point uses both bill length for the X and bill depth for the Y, geom smooth uses the same. And so if you do it this way, then it's going to be inherited by both of these. And that just means that not only will the lines be colored by species, but the dots will also be. So both of the parts of the chart will be um, colored by that, that grouping. And if you just wanted one of these, you could, um, well, actually I'll show you that later, but yeah, I'll show you that later. So for now, just know that like in aesthetics that if you map um, something to a variable in your data set, then any of the geomes that come below that aesthetic call will inherit that property. So they will also be colored by species. Yeah, and so that's that's how it works with like a categorical variable that it's colored by grouping since that's like a factor and there's different groups there. But you can also use it for a um, numeric variable and that will provide you with like a range of colors. So say we want to keep our scatter plot with the bill length and the bill depth. But we also want some sort of information in there about the weight of the penguin then we can map color to body mass, for example, and that's not a group. So there's not going to be any sort of grouping that becomes available or becomes apparent in the graph here. But what it's going to do is just like give a color that that represents like where on the scale of weights that are present in our data, these penguins fall. So you can see that these penguins down here are the heaviest ones, these like light, the lightest blue circles, whereas like the darkest blue are the smallest ones. So here we don't have any information about the groupings, but you can kind of see that, that this species, for example, is just bigger. Yeah, and then I just want to emphasize this again, um, which is that if you put it inside the AES with no quotes, then you will map another variable, like a third variable or sometimes a second um, into your into your plot. You don't have to tell it if it's numeric or categorical, like Aro can already figure that out. And then if you put it within the geome call with quotations, that's when you'll get a solid color. And then so with fill, the things work pretty much the same. It's just that you are using fill to color like an, a bigger open space. 
And so this works the same way with the AES um, inside the AES to map it to another variable or inside the geome in quotes to just have a plain color. So if we are looking at like a bar chart of species and we give geome bar the argument of fill is pink, then we'll just get pink bars. Um, but if we want to bring species into it, like we did in the in the scatter plot, then we can put fill equals species, no quotes in the AES call. And um, that will color them by species. You can see here, because I've used like the x-axis of species and the fill of species, uh, they are colored. Like it's not introducing another variable. It's actually just mapping the same variable that we've already displayed or already kind of, it's already informative about that variable to color as well. So that's why it's giving like each of the bars its own color because these are the same. And then we could also use it to add an additional variable. So say we wanted species as the bars, but we wanted the color to represent um, the sex of the penguin. Then we could do fill is sex and it would give us that information as well. So basically the difference there is that we're, yeah, we're giving a unique variable here. And just to show you a little trick here, um, geom bar has an option called, um, oh, I just blanked on it. Method equals, is that right? No. Is it, are you looking for dodge? Yeah. yeah. I believe it's position. Yeah, okay. Yes. I have briefly blanked on that, but um, it's position. So you can also do position equals dodge and that will put these two bars next to each other, which I mean, in this scenario, it doesn't really help us, but sometimes that's a little bit easier to see. Just as a little extra tip there. And we've used fill here and you can see we've used fill because it's like a big area that needs to be like totally, totally filled in, but we can also uh, use color and so if we just change the same plot to have color is species, then all it's going to do is like change the color of the outside line. So yeah, that's because color is used for small things like lines and fill is used for big spaces. So a bar chart can technically take both color and fill. Here, this obviously makes very little sense unless you have some sort of a theme going on, like an aesthetic look that this looks good on. Um, but it can use that. And you can also use both. So if I wanted like geom bar and I wanted the fill to be pink, and if I give color equals purple, then it will do like purple lines with pink boxes inside. And you can also do this when you do map to an aesthetic, uh, sorry, to a variable. So if I want X to be species and I want each of these species to receive their own color, then I can use X as species, the fill is species, um, and I can still specify that I still want purple borders around them and that will just give me purple borders around them. And yeah, because color is used for um, lines. And the same kind of idea where big areas are used, um, uh, big areas take fill and small areas take color is also used like in box plots and violin plots. So for example, if we have a box plot and we want to do species by build depth, which I think we did earlier. So we can just look at what that looks like. Then we have the two variables represented here. So species is the grouping and the Y axis is the um, build depth. And if we, we use fill is equal to sex, then that will again, bring that third variable into the call and make box plots that are separate by them. Or if we use this to say species, which is a variable that we already have represented, then it will just color them without introducing any new information to the plot. And um, so that's how fill looks on a box plot, but you can also use color here. And that is just going to change the lines of the box plot. So a couple of the geomes can take both filler color and you just have to think about if you want like a big part of the plot to be colored or if you're looking for like the lines to be colored. So of course, once you have your nice chart and you have it all ready, you might wanna change the labels. Like here we have 
no capitals and it just has like the exact name of the column as the axis label. And you can change these pretty easily using the labs call. So here what we have so far, just this top part is um, the plot that we saw before with bill depth and bill length. We've seen a couple of times now just separated by groups and I put like a straight line by group on each of the um, subsections here. But you can see that the, like the y axis here is again just the name of the column. So we can add plus and then labs. And there's a couple of options that you can put within labs. So you can have an X label where you just give X equals and the text that you want the X label. You can give the Y label in the same way. Um, let's just look at that first, just to have a little bit shorter code to look at here. So you can see, we just call labs once we open the parentheses and then we give the label for X and then a comma and the label for Y. That will just change these two labels here. But the labs, as you saw a second ago, have a lot more, a lot more options. So you can also change the color label. That would be what shows up on the, the legend here. So say we just want to capitalize it, we can just write it with capitalize. It would also work that way for fill if you wanted to give um, a label. Yeah, if you're using fill. And you can give a title, a subtitle, and a caption. So we'll see this in a second. So this is the label. This is the title, the subtitle, and um, the caption is just this little, little text on the bottom. So just by one call of labs, you can assign all these different text options. Um, you can also use x equals null or y equals null if you don't want like a label on that, that axis. axis. And then, like I showed you a second ago, you can also add these themes. So I showed theme minimal in the examples, but here's theme light. That looks pretty similar to theme minimal, but gives like, I think this, this box might be different. And what you can do is use ours like autocomplete here. If you start to use, um, start to type theme, then you get a couple different options like theme void is a funny one. Um, that one has like nothing on it at all. So if you're doing more of an infographic style, something like that might work, or there's um, just a whole bunch of themes that you can use. Like, yeah, most of these are more for publication. They're not exactly like the fun options that you might use for like a, a tidy Tuesday plot that you just want to post on Twitter, but they're really good for yeah making consistent themes for publication or for more professional applications. And you can actually set a lot of these theme options yourself. So this is kind of like a preset of a whole bunch of options. And we're hoping at some point to continue with a few more ggplot um, meetups here with um, our ladies Freiburg. And we will talk about that at some point. So how to, how to make your own custom themes that then you can use for all your plots. But for now, it's good to just know the defaults because they're really easy to implement. Okay, so I think that's pretty easy to understand. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about code variation. So this whole time we've been putting AES outside of the geome, outside of the ggplot call, just in the middle, like just on its own line. But you don't have to do that. And um, what's quite common is you can put it inside of the geome. And if you do this, so here you can see we have geome point. And instead of having AES on its own line, like we saw it before, before we would have seen it like here. So instead of having something like that, um, then we would take that AES and we could put it inside of the geome. So it looks like this. And you could put it inside, but you have to put it inside both of them because like now, yeah, this geome smooth doesn't have any information. So the geomes can't inherit from a different geome. They can only inherit from like the AES being on its own or in one other position, which I'll show. But if you want to do it on their own, then you have to have both of these. Uh, yeah, you have to specify within both geomes. And before we had this method or yeah, method equals LM to have straight lines. And all you have to remember there is that it, that didn't come in the geome, so it uh, didn't come in the AES. So before when we had AES on its own line, then the method equals LM was inside only the geome. So when we do it here, we actually have to put it outside of this uh, call. So we can't put it inside of AES, we have to put it outside of AES. 
So anything that would have come in the geome call in our, in our um, syntax above has to come outside of the AES call, if, even if you put it inside of the geome. So that would also be true if we wanted, for example, to make all of these dots pink. Then that has to come outside of the AES because that's not an aesthetic mapping. It's just an extra uh, argument that you're specifying there. Okay, so you can also put it inside of the geome. And this gives you a little bit more control over what you show with each one. So like I showed there, if you want like pink dots, but you still want lines that are separated by species, then you can add color or pink just to the dots. And same if you wanted like the species to be shown as different color dots, but you just wanted one trend line for all of the data. So I'll show you this with the visual. So what, because we've put color equals species only within the, the geome for point, and we haven't put it inside of the geome with smooth, then it, it does color the points by species, but it's only giving us one line because we're not separating the lines by species. So that gives you a little bit more control over what you want to do. And it's, yeah, exactly. So this is kind of what I showed you before that you can also change the color by putting that outside of the AES. Like if you wanted to have a yellow line, you could change color equals yellow just within the line geome, which is the smooth geome um, and outside of the AES. That would give you like one yellow line. Or for another example here, if we wanted the, the dots to be green, we could do color is dark green for the dots and color is yellow for the lines. Just gives you a little bit more control uh, over how you specify the two different geomes. And this is um, what happens here. We've forgotten, intentionally forgotten and put yellow inside of the AES for the geome smooth. And that's going to throw a similar kind of error to what we saw before, that it says it's yellow, but it's really red. And then one other option that you can do is, um, so we had like this code which we haven't, we didn't show here, I'll just change it on this code, is you can actually take your entire AES and put it inside of the ggplot call. And if you do that, then that's going to be the same as putting it on its own line. So anything below it will inherit that. So this is, so putting it inside of the ggplot call is the same as putting it on its own line. So you can do that as you like, but it's good to know or good to realize that if it's inside of its own AES call or if it's inside of the ggplot call in general, then anything below will inherit those, those options. Whereas if it's only in a geome, then another geome won't inherit it from that geome. Sorry. Okay, so um, yeah, piping into a ggplot call. So we have here with the ggplot, with the standard ggplot syntax, you see that the first, the first uh, argument that you give it is the data, which is traditional of the tidyverse. And that means that we can pipe into the, right into the ggplot. So a basic example of that would just be taking penguins and piping it into the ggplot call. And then you just leave that empty because it's being piped in. It already gets that information. And that works just the same as if you had given it as the first argument. But this means that you can do a lot of intermediate steps before you put before you start the, the ggplot. So for example, if we want to look at the penguins data set, but we only want to visualize those penguins that live on the dream island, then we can take the penguins data frame. We can first pipe it to filter, which is going to, of course, just give us only those rows that are on the dream island. And then we can take that and pipe it on to the ggplot call. And this is the same plot that we had above. And then you'll see that it only shows the species that are present on the dream island. So in this case, the Gen 2 penguins aren't on the dream island. So they're not shown, they don't show up at all. So you could change that. You could also change that and look at the other islands or you could say that you wanted only a certain species here. So you could um, have only the Gen 2 species, for example. So you can do a lot of like subsetting with filter before ggplot, that's really helpful. 
Another common thing you might do is remove NAs. Often you don't need to do that this that often with, with ggplot, like we saw with the histograms that it gave like a warning that it dropped two rows that were because they were non-finite values, which just means that they were NAs. And so they did that automatically, but you can also drop it um, on your own before. And that's really helpful because if you drop NAs from your data set, like it will delete that whole row. So you don't necessarily want to do that and then save the data and then like use it later for analysis and not realize that you've lost like entire rows, but you can drop it just within the pipe. So take the data set, drop the, drop the NA and then do the plot. And that's not actually going to like delete that, those rows from your data set. It's just going to like temporarily drop them for the use of the ggplot. So here, say we wanted to drop NAs from the sex column, then when we do this kind of um, violin plot that we had above, then you can see that we only have like female and male and we don't have the NA category that we had before. And what we had here a second ago is actually adding a third geome, which is geome jitter, which will show the dots on top. So I think we just added that to show that you can have a third geome too. And geome jitter, the only reason that that's different from geome point is that it adds like a little bit of noise to each to each spot. Cause you can see that here, if we line them all up right on the exact line for their category, we just get this weird um, collection of dots. But if we add like a little bit of noise then it will spread them out over the data set. Okay, and then just final notes that we wanted to touch on. You can save plots to a variable and then call them by giving the variable name. You just do this by assigning a plot to um, a name, just like you would assign anything to a variable name with this arrow. So if we do that, then whenever, first of all, it shows up here. And when we call penguin plot, it will show that plot. And a kind of cool thing you can do now if we have penguin plot saved as a variable, we can go ahead and like add on more to this. So we can just take penguin plot by its name and then we can add the labels and the theme that we added before. And we can kind of do this in a second step if we want to. So that just adds the labels and the theme. And if you have a plot saved as a variable name, you can also use gg save to save this plot to um, like a JPEG or different types of file types and you just call gg save and the first argument is the name that you want the file to have and the second argument is which file you want saved there and i believe that gg save also has some options for um, the width and the height and you can either set that in inches centimeters or millimeters and so you can say you were had like multiple plots and you want to put them in a paper or something you could set them all to be a consistent size like two inches by three inches so you just have to play around with that about what size, but that's, yeah, that's one of the more convenient ways to save it. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's all we have today for ggplot. That was a really kind of, that's the groundwork of ggplot. Once you really understand the logic of the layers and what's coming with the layers and what it does, if you put something inside of AES or outside of AES, um, then you can really start to grow under ggplot skills. So there's tons of options like you saw with like line width or with the boxes or transparency, lots of things you can play around with. We put some of our favorite links here. Uh, we like to look at like the R graph gallery all the time and trying to make new types of plots. And these are also like two different type yeah, resources. I think this one is um, by Gail Barr and Lisa DeBrian and they have some examples that you can also work through. And we're also really, oh, that's this link here actually. And yeah, we are hoping to do a lot more ggplot stuff in the future maybe. So we're thinking about doing stuff with custom colors and with your own themes or different types of plots that you don't see every day or like adjacent packages that you can use. Um, and if you have any ideas for something that you would want to learn in those, go ahead and like put, put it in the, in the chat. If there's something, if you have ideas, feel free to like send those to us or send them in the chat. Um, and we will definitely take those into mind because we like to play around with ggplot and hopefully we can show you some cool stuff in the future too.